Okay, hello and welcome to this lesson on how the Russian economy developed up to the year of 1914. This lesson is going to be particularly useful to you if you're a year 12 or year 13 student and you're looking at the course on Tsarist and Communist Russia from 1855 to 1964. However, it's also going to be of use to anyone with a general interest in Russian history or with an interest in the history of this period leading up to the cusp of war in 1914. So what are our learning objectives for today's lesson? There are two. The first one is, unsurprisingly, we are going to look at what the main economic developments were in Russia up to 1914. So if you've been studying this course so far, you will have looked a little bit at developments under Mikhail von Reuten and Ivan Vishnogradsky under Tsars Alexander II and III. And now in this lesson, we're going to be looking at developments under Sergei Vita and Tsar Nicholas II up to 1914. The second learning objective is we're going to consider how far the economy changed between 1855, so back when the course began, and 1914, the period under study today. It will help you just to get that one key word down for today, which is the rather nice word PUD, which is just a Russian measurement of weight that will be helpful when we're looking at some of the raw economic data later on in the lesson. So let's start off with a recap. Where was Russia's economy at around the start of our course in 1855? Cast your minds back. What was the dominant mode of economic activity in the country in 1855? What did economic activity look like? Where was the level of industrial development? You may remember that the Russian economy was primarily based around serfdom. That means peasant farming. The vast majority of people in Russia at that time were serfs either working at a state mere, a collective farm, or directly for a landlord in a manner not too dissimilar to slavery. And that meant that the country had a really low level of industrial development compared to its rivals in Western Europe. The rest of Western Europe had gone through a process like the Industrial Revolution and had the development of capitalism well underway by this point in history, by the mid 19th century. But Russia was different. Russia was still using patterns of economic activity, serfdom and peasant farming, that had really existed since the medieval and feudal period. And it had largely not changed. They were still using those patterns. And so they were lagging behind their rivals. So where are we going in this lesson then? Well, Number one, we're going to look at some of the raw data, some of the facts, the figures, the graphs and statistics around economic developments up to 1914. That's one thing we're going to do. But there's also a second thing I'm going to try to do, which is that I'm going to try to persuade you of something. And you can be the judge of whether I've succeeded or not at the end of this lesson. What I'm going to try to persuade you of is that although all of this raw data may appear dry and perhaps even uninteresting to you, Actually, all of this raw data is crucial to understanding the much wider events that took place uh, around that economic development, including really momentous events like the First World War and the Russian Revolution of 1917 that's going to be so critical later on in your course. What seems like just a set of facts, a set of raw pieces of economic data actually underlies all of those uh, wider developments. So again, let's recap on who we visited so far in this course in terms of the finance ministers. We started out with Mikhail von Reuten, who was the Minister of Finance from 1862 to 1878. And he was minister under Tsar Alexander II, the Tsar Liberator. Then we get Ivan Vishnogradsky. He's a key figure, a finance minister from 1887 to 1892. Some industrialization does take place under Vishnogradsky. There's a degree of growth of factories and a, a small shift away from serfdom towards the industrial working class under Vishnogradsky. But it is really under Sergei Vita, who is the finance minister from 1892 to 1903 uh, and has some of his reign under Tsar Alexander II's rule, it's really under Vita that things start to develop at pace. The economy starts to rocket from strength to strength under Sergei Vita. So if I were to give you the whole lesson in one slide, this would really be it. This is what it boils down to. Russia's economy in the 1890s shoots upwards. 
there's an economic boom. From 1894 to 1913, they are averaging a growth rate of 8% per year. Now, that may not sound like much to you. It might sound modest. 8% uh, perhaps doesn't sound like a lot. However, let's put this in perspective. The modern British economy, if you put aside the last couple of years where things have been affected by coronavirus, and so the data is a little chaotic, the modern British economy has tended to be growing at about 0.2 to 0.4% per year. And the modern British economy is one of the strongest in the whole world today. Britain is one of the richest countries in the world. And yet the growth rate uh, is around that. The Russian economy back at this stage, leading up to 1914, is growing an average of 8% per year. So it's vastly outpacing the modern British economy. And you can see how that's borne out from the last bullet point on this slide here. The economy grew more in that short period just in those couple of decades, really, than it had in the entire preceding century. So if you picture this in your mind, it's almost as though Russia has been kind of ambling along, almost in stasis for hundreds of years. Although different leaders have come and gone, different wars have been fought, the essential patterns of life and economic, economic activity of work have remained really pretty much static. They've remained the same. Serfdom has been dominant. And then suddenly, in the 1890s, there is this boom under Sergei Vita. Something changes. The shape of the country, the face of its economy has changed. So how did they do this? Well, as we've said, Sergei Vita was absolutely critical in this process. He was the finance minister from 1892 to 1903, when a lot of this industrialization took place. Now, Key to understanding Sergei Vita is understanding why he was so desperate to modernize the Russian economy. Well, the reason was Sergei Vita was loyal to Tsarism and he wanted to stop all of the wave of opposition to Tsarism that had been bubbling up over the prior decades. So earlier on in the course, you will have looked at different opposition groups. You had the liberal intelligentsia, the doctors, the professors, the teachers, the lawyers, who all wanted Russia to democratise and to look more like a kind of liberal capitalist country, such as Britain, for example. Then you had people like the Narodniks, who, although they were mostly members of the nobility themselves, they encouraged peasant uprisings to radically overhaul the whole way that Russian society was working. They would assassinate police chiefs. They had several assassination attempts against the Tsars themselves. And then finally, you had the Marxists, who were advocating uh, a working class overthrow of Tsarism. So opposition had really been building to a crescendo, especially around 1905 with the failed 1905 revolution, which although it failed, uh, represented the most serious challenge to Tsarism that had yet existed. So all of Tsarism's allies, all of the friends of the autocracy, have this mission to try to now defend it from the opposition that has been thrown up against it. And they, broadly speaking, got two ways of doing that. Number one, they've got the methods of Stolopin, Stolopin's necktie, violence and repression against the opponents of Tsarism, their arrest, their exile, their public hanging in a lot of cases, the use of the secret police and the Okrana. So they've got the stick in one hand. But what Vita realises is they can't just use the stick. They need the stick, but they also need the carrot. They need some method of raising the living standards of ordinary people in Russia so that those people actually buy into Tsarism and support it in the first place. And Sergei Vita believes industrialization is going to be able to do that for the country. It will be able to lift the living standard up so that people actually support Tsarism to begin with and never want to oppose it. So how does he go about doing this? Well, there are three methods. Number one, he decides he's going to raise interest rates to encourage foreign loans to come into the country, and this will help fund some of those industrial projects. Secondly, he's going to prioritise heavy industry. So that's natural resources like oil and coal, which Russia is fairly rich in. He's going to prioritise that and look to develop the economy off the back of that heavy industry. And then third, he's going to raise foreign investment to fund things like railways, electricity plants, mining and oil fields. So I said in this lesson we would have two objectives. One would be to look at the raw economic data 
And the other would be to explain how some of that raw economic data explains wider social developments that were taking place at the time. This picture is an illustration of one of those wider social developments. So I just want you to have a look at it here. You may want to pause the video for a moment, perhaps bullet point down what you can see. Just start at a basic level. So most people will notice the man in the middle here. You're absolutely right to notice him. He's crucial in Russian history. I'm going to say who he is in a minute. You'll also notice that there is a crowd around him and they're all listening to him speak. Some of you will have noticed there's the smoke up in the background and you may have noticed the kinds of factories I've given the game away there, the kind of buildings that there are here, which are factories. So this is an industrial district. It's a factory area known as the Putilov Ironworks. Now, this scene would not have been possible before industrialization. Before industrialization, everyone, broadly speaking, would have been a serf. The vast majority of people were serfs. They were working on a, a collective farm, either a state mere or a land, a landowner's farm. And although they were working with uh, small groups of other people, essentially their lives were quite isolated from uh, wider communities. They were illiterate, they were loyal to the Orthodox Church, they were loyal to the Tsar, and they farmed their land in methods that were identical with those that had been used for hundreds of years. Their worlds were quite small. After industrialization, that all changes. You get scenes like this, crowds of thousands all joining together in the same place. And now something else has changed as well. They are literate. In order to do these industrial jobs, they have to be trained to a certain standard of literacy to carry out the jobs to a reasonable enough standard. And therefore their perspectives are also broader. So we've now got this situation where there are thousands of workers, thousands uh, of what's known as the proletariat, the industrial working class, all together in the same place communicating every day, sharing new ideas that are available to them with their newfound levels of literacy. Do you see how this could pose a threat? Sergei Vitter hoped that industrialization would prevent opposition to the Tsar, would curb it. But what's actually happened here, what Vitter has risked, is that he's created a new layer, a new social class of people who are going to pose a more credible, a more competent threat to the Tsarist autocracy, because they're there cl clustered in these urban centers, all able to communicate with each other and with new ideas. Now that man in the middle is a Marxist. He's someone who believed the working class could rise up and overthrow Tsarism and create a communist society. And the Marxists were in a sense proven right by this process of industrialization or partially proven right, because it did create a new working class in larger numbers than exist than had existed before. And that class was able to provide a more powerful threat to Tsarism. Whereas the peasants had only been able to attempt to assassinate people, uh, burn houses down, burn the landlord's house down. These were brief flashes of violence against the autocracy that were quickly cracked down on. They had nowhere else to go really in terms of the tactics that they could use. But what these industrial workers can do is they can go on strike. They can bring the whole of the Russian economy to its knees quite quickly. And so they've got more power than they had before. That man in the middle is Vladimir Lenin. He is the leader of the communist revolution in 1917, the leader of the Bolshevik party, and is a crucial figure in Russian history and in, in world history really for the 20th century. And he was able to make his progress politically to get where he wanted to go because of the industrialization process. So there's an irony here. Sergei Vita wanted to curb opposition to Tsarism and has inadvertently laid the ground for a much deeper challenge to that autocratic method of uh, ruling Russian society. I think this quote helps to give a sense of the emotional mood of what I've just been speaking about. So we saw the picture there. This was what it was like from one of the participants in those kind of scenarios on the ground. His name was Father Gapon. He's a really interesting figure. He was someone who led the 1905 revolution protests, uh, a radical socialist priest. And uh, he's an interesting figure because although he led the 1905 revolution, he later became a police collaborator. He advocated working together with the, uh, the secret police, the Okhrana in Russia. 
And as you might expect, that was controversial with Gapon's fellow uh, revolutionaries. If you're interested, I uh, encourage you to go and research Father Gapon and how his life ended. It's an interesting story. For now, we'll stay with this quote here. St. Petersburg seethed with excitement. All the factories, mills and workshops gradually stopped working till at last not one chimney remained smoking in the great industrial district. Thousands of men and women gathered incessantly before the premises of the branches of the Workmen's Association. So Gapon's giving you that idea there of what it was like to be an industrial worker at that time, or even just to be present in those industrial centres. There's this buzz, there's this energy in the air that's come about from that new social class existing and with all of those new ideas and possibilities open to them. And it's an energy that is not going to bode well for the future of the Tsarist autocracy. So back then to a little bit more of the data. By 1914, Russia has created 62,000 kilometres of railway track. That makes them the country with the second largest amount of railway track in the world at that time, more than double what they had before Sir Guy Vitter's reign as finance minister. The country that had the most in the world at this time was the USA. They had about half a million kilometres of track, so they're way ahead. But nonetheless, uh, Russia being second was very significant. They'd also created something called the Trans-Siberian Railway, which connected Russia with the Far East for trade. So this railway was not only an economic achievement in its own right, it also further aided the process of industrialization because it stimulated trade with other parts uh, of the world. Secondly, it actually helped stimulate all the other industrial projects that take place because there'd been in Russia an ambition before this point to set about developing the economy industrially, but manufacturers and employers have been put off by the transport costs. If they were to set up, for example, an electricity plant, there are transport costs associated with doing that uh, in terms of bringing in the resources necessary to run that kind of plant. However, with all of these public railways, those transport costs are dramatically reduced. And so business becomes much more viable and much more feasible in terms of developing the economy industrially. So the railway is an achievement in itself, but it also has that knock-on effect, kind of virtuous cycle of developing the rest of the economy. It's also significant for one more reason, which is a, a military reason. Again, you may wish to just pause here and see if you can remember it. So that military reason is there are at least two major instances in the course so far that we've looked at where Russia perhaps ought to have won the war that it was in. Those are the Crimean War and the Russo-Japanese War. In both of those wars, Russia had a numerical advantage. The population of Russia uh, is vast compared to its opponents in those wars, and therefore the number of soldiers outnumbers its opponent. However, they lost in both wars on account of a couple of factors. One, their weapons were not modern enough, not um, competent or capable enough. And number two, their transport infrastructure let them down. So in the Crimean War especially, there were some battles where their soldiers literally could not be present in time because the railways could not get them there efficiently enough. And so they suffered these humiliating defeats. And the Russian government was really keen to make sure that that never happened again. A little bit more data for you. So coal production soars from 183 million puds, there's our keyword, in 1890 to 671 million by 1900. Clearly an enormous achievement there. And what that means is Russia has now become, by 1914, the fifth greatest industrial power in the entire world. So Russia has gone from this position of being a relatively backward, feudal, medieval-based economy in 1855, with everything revolving around serfdom, to being the fifth greatest industrial power in the world, an impressive achievement. And they use that industrial power to re-equip their army. They're going to recoup all those losses that they took in the Russo-Japanese War leading up to 1905. And the army is now going to be in considerably better shape as a result of that industrialization process. Now, that does not go unnoticed by the rest of the world. All of Russia's rivals, especially Germany, sees what is happening here, and they fear the process of Russia industrialising. It's a key cause of the First World War. Have a little look at this quote on the slide behind me. This is from a German diplomat 
who was observing the process of industrialization in Russia and voicing his fears of what could happen. This is what he said. In a few years, according to all expert opinion, Russia will be ready to strike. Then she will crush us with the number of her soldiers. Then she will have built her Baltic fleet and strategic railways. Our group, meanwhile, will be growing steadily weaker. Russia knows this well. So what he's saying here is, look, Russia outnumbers us. It has a, an existing structural advantage in terms of military competition with the rest of Europe. The only thing that's held it back so far is its level of industrial development. And it now appears to be developing itself on that axis very rapidly. The Germans feared that if they allowed Russia to continue to industrialize, then Russia would simply overwhelm all of her enemies, of which Germany was one. So it was a key factor in the Kaiser's decision to launch the First World War, to act aggressively in 1914, because he thought he had to strike while the iron was hot, so to speak, because Russia seemed to be industrialising at such a fearful pace. So again, it's the raw data that underlies the wider story of something as momentous and international and significant as the First World War. So as we've said, Sergei Vita decided to prioritise heavy industry, but he kind of went for a small number of very large factories. It wasn't necessarily that the total amount of factories shot up by an enormous amount. It was that factories increased, and of those uh, factories that were new, they tended to house a very large number of workers, often over a 1,000 people present in them. And again, think back to how that links to the theories of the Marxists. The Marxists are saying, look, so far we have failed to topple Tsarism, but if the industrial working class grows strong enough, then that will become possible. There will be a social class with the power and the will to uh, enact a revolutionary change within Russia. Of all of those new industrial sites, there's a couple that it would be good to take particular note of, and they are the Baku coal fields and the Putilov ironworks. The picture that we looked at earlier in this lesson was of the Putilov ironworks, and it's something that comes up again and again as a site uh, within the course that you're studying. Just to finish off then, uh, a few graphs for you to look at. There are arguments sort of for and against the extent to which Sergei Vita pulled off this economic miracle. There are some arguments uh, that there were limits to what he did. Have a little look at these pie charts. They illustrate that story. So on the top left there, you can see that the state revenue, which is just the money coming into central government, has gone from 2 billion rubles in 1908 to 4 billion in 1914. So in just six years, the state revenue uh, has doubled. Then if you look at the number of banks, a, uh, a similar story is being told there, practically a doubling within six years. However, if you look at the number of factories and workers, the increase appears to be a little bit more modest. Yes, there is an increase, uh, but it doesn't seem as dramatic as the increase in state revenue. So there are some caveats and nuances to the process of industrialization under Sergei Vita. And again, this is borne out when you look at the heavy resources. Uh, so coal, pig iron, oil and grain. In some of these resources, there appears to be very dramatic growth. In others, uh, something approaching stasis, significant continuity. So there are limits uh, to the process of industrialization, despite the fact that uh, a very real uptick did take place. So just to finish off, I would recommend that you do these activities. What is your overall opinion to this question of how strong the Russian economy was by 1914? And can you foresee any weaknesses in the Russian economy? Is this going to sow the seeds for or lead to any problems for the state of Russia by 1914? What unforeseen consequences could there be to Sergei Vita's project of industrialization? Thank you for listening, guys, and good luck with the rest of your course.